that be involved. If you'll open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And uh, we are once again going through the book of 2 Corinthians. And it started off by saying that God is a God of all comfort. And we know that each one of us in our lives go through times and periods in our lives when we indeed need comfort. We lose a loved one. Somebody we love is in the hospital. All different types of issues to where we cry out to God and we can understand and know the comfort that only God can give. And it's miraculous and it's tremendous and it's glorious. It's like the ongoing joy that God places in our heart. We are transformed by the power of God. And we know where God is. God lives within us. And he lives within us to do what we can't do. We cannot keep the law. We cannot please God all the time. We cannot overcome many mountains and difficulties that come into our life. But we know we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Amen. He is our ability to do what we can't do. Now the Apostle Paul, he went through some tremendously difficult days in his life. We know he was beaten several times. He was shipwrecked. He was snake bit. All sorts of things happened to the Apostle Paul. He was stoned and left for dead one time outside a city. And they all walked away and thought he was dead, but God wasn't through with him. He shook him and got him up, and away he continued. We know that we have an overcoming conqueror who lives in us. But Paul struggled. He had problems with what they called Judaizers. Now, what were the Judaizers? They were individuals. They were Jews. And what they did, they believed the gospel of Jesus Christ to a certain point. What they wanted to do, they took the grace of God and they tried to co-mingle it with works. Well, you know what? It says no one will be justified by works. All works do is show you how unpowerful you are, how weak you are to do those things that God wants us to do. So here, the Apostle Paul was talking about the Corinthian church. And not only were the Judaizers giving him problems, but also the church in Jerusalem was giving him some problems. They had given these Judaizers what they called letters of commendation. In other words, back in that day, when you went into a church, they didn't have a phone to pick up and call somewhere to check up on you. So what these guys would do, they would get letters from certain individuals in a church that would commend them to the other church, the Corinthian church. And they would take those letters of commendation into the church and they would receive them. Now, not only were the Judaizers perverting the gospel, but the Judaizers were also taking money from the Corinthian church, so much so that they couldn't support the Apostle Paul. Now that's mind boggling to think about. And we know when we started 1 Corinthians 3, they were a divided church. Some of them followed Apollos. Some of them followed Jesus, they said. Some of them listened and followed Paul. Now, who started the church at Corinth? It was the Apostle Paul. And yet it seemed like throughout his ministry to them, they, he was continually trying to show them who he was and what he had done. But there was a group within the church that simply did not like him. Now, you know what they didn't like? In the first Corinthians church, that letter he wrote to first Corinthians, he admonished them about sin in the church. And you know what? That ruffled some feathers. It made some of them viciously upset at him. They were the type of church that said, hey, we're cool. We're hip. 
We're showing that we can let things like that go on in the church and you can still come on down to church. Little did they understand, like we've said many times before, a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump. A little bit of accepted sin changes the whole church. It lowers the bar. It shows that if it feels good, you just go ahead and do it. And we're still going to accept you. Now, don't misunderstand me. We don't judge sin to hurt each other. We judge sin to help each other. You know, if I was going out every Friday night at some bar in Bridgeport and getting drunk, and some of the church members saw me, should they just turn the other way? Or should they try to intervene in my life to help me? You know what I firmly believe? I would rather have them come into my life and help me. Throw out the lifeline. Show me that I'm sinning and I'm doing wrong. And most of all, show me that I am putrefying the name of Christ before our community. You know, I was thinking yesterday, and I always think about this when I wear a shirt that says Jesus on it. I want to be careful not to get mad at anybody. I want to be careful not to say anything that they would misinterpret. I want to be everything Jesus wants me to be. Amen? Amen. Because the world already has a bad rep on Jesus. They look at preachers that have failed. They look at churches that were wicked. They look at all these things that have been perverted through the years and they say, Aha, look there. They're just like me. I don't need to go to church. But we know that's not true. It is true we sin. It is true we fall short. But hopefully we don't glory in our wickedness. The fact that Christ convicts us when we sin. And we're willing to say, Lord, I blew it. But Lord, give me another chance. Help me. Keep me going. You know, my... My son used to run cross country, and I always marveled at cross country runners because they had to have lots of endurance to finish the race. You know what? We're in a race. Whether you realize it or not, we are running the race for Jesus Christ. And Satan likes to hinder us with sin that will slow us down that will make us weaker, that will make us unaffected in ministry for Christ. That's why when we sin, we must quickly deal with our sin. What does it say in 1 John 1, 9? We confess our sin. It makes us forgive them. It cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Amen. That's great, Brother Orville. That's exactly right. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive our sins. What a glorious Savior we have. Now we know once we're saved, we're never going to be unsaved. The worst that can happen to a truly saved person is God just takes them out. He just takes them on to heaven because they're a bad testimony to his name. So we want to be sure that not only do we run the race, but we let the power of the Holy Spirit transform our life to where people will see Jesus is real. He transforms lives. He gives us joy. He gives us comfort. He gives us peace. He provides for every need you have in your life. Do I think he's going to let you go starving? No, I don't think that. Do I think he's going to let you have to live without electricity? No, I don't think that. I think God has promised to meet our needs and to watch over us. So here the Apostle Paul, once again in chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians, talks about letters of commendation from the different churches and what they mean. Turn there if you would. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need as some letters of commendation to you or from you? It says, listen, do we have to bring these little letters from the church at Jerusalem to show that we're the real deal? He said, hopefully not. 
God used me to start your church. Why in the world would I need a letter of commendation? Look what he said. You are our letter. Now, what does he mean by that? You are our letter. Written in our hearts, known and re uh, read by all men, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ. Now, let's stop right there for a moment. How are you a letter for Christ? Well, by the words you say, by what you do, by how you spend your spare time. God shows the world that you are his, and he shows the community that you are his, and he transforms your life so that you are a living letter of Jesus Christ. And then he goes on and says, verse 2, read, read by all men, verse 3, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ, fear for us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Now, what is he talking about, tablets of stone, written on tablets of stone? Well, we know what that is. That's the Old Testament. That is the Ten Commandments. How many of us keep the Ten Commandments? Keep them hands down. None of us do. <laughs> None of us are able to do that. Then you say, well, then why in the world did God give us the Ten Commandments? He gave the Ten Commandments to stir up sin in our life. When I tried not to covet, according to the word of God, to keep the law, to keep the, the stone tablets, what he said, I found out the more I tried to quit coveting, the more I coveted. It's like your kids. Now, don't get into this cookie jar. I made your favorite jelly cookies in here, but don't you get into them till later on at snack time. Well, what happened? Those kids sit back and think about it. And mama or daddy leaves the room. And before you know it, they're digging into that cookie jar. When if you hadn't said anything about it, they never would have thought about it. But that's the way sin works. The, the tablets, all they did was stir up more desire to sin all the time. More desire to sleep around, more desire to cuss around, more desire to be accepted by our friends. Not what God wanted, but God showed us there is no way to be saved by keeping the law. Then you say, how are we saved? Same way Abraham was. Abraham did what? Believed God, and it was imputed to him for righteousness. It wasn't his works, and we know Abraham did works. What did God tell Abraham to do with Isaac? He said, take your son, your only son, and bring him to Mount Moriah and offer him there as a sacrifice to me. And Abraham said, God, did you really tell me to do that? Did I hear right? Do I understand what you just said? And God said, go. And so Abraham took the wood and took some servants and he gathered up the wood from the donkeys and Isaac carried it. And up Mount Moriah they went. And then Abraham, he wasn't fooling around, he raised up his knife to stab it in the heart of Isaac. And God said, whoa, stop Abraham. Now I know that you wouldn't conceal even your son from me, the son whom you so dearly love. And sure enough, a ram was caught in the thicket and they sacrificed the ram. You know what? God knows our heart. Amen? Amen. He knows what you like. He knows what you don't like. He knows what you think. He's all around you every day in every way. And that can be comforting. That can be a blessing. Or that can give us pause. If we know that God is always watching and listening to everything we say and do. 
So Abraham believed God and it was imputed to him as righteousness. So then why mess with works? Why, why try to keep the law? Well, you know what? The law also is a revelation of the character of God. He said, love, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, long-suffering. That's God. And that's the way God wants us to be. But he also explains that even though we can't do it on our own, he transforms our heart to where because we love him, we're going to do it. Look at what it says. Very interesting. Such confidence, verse 4, we have through Christ towards God. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves. But our adequacy is from God, who also made us adequate as servants of a what? New covenant. Not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit does what? Gives life. God, the Holy Spirit, transforms our heart and makes us want to do what God said that they had to do in the Old Testament. You know what? If Christianity is still a have to in your heart, something's wrong. I have to go to church. I have to give money. I have to do this. I have to do that. No, no. If that's the way your attitude is, keep your money. Pray about your relationship with Christ. Because if you truly have Jesus Christ living in you, he transforms your heart from a have to to what? To a want to. I want to do that because I love the Lord Jesus. I want to show love. I want to show peace. I want to show comfort to people. I want to encourage people to follow the Lord. I want to give. Man, the more I give, the more God blesses me. And so, it's Jeremiah 31, 31. Turn there for a minute. Jeremiah 31, 31. The new covenant. The new deal that God made with us. Jeremiah 31, 31. A wonderful portion of scripture that explains what God does when we're saved. Verse 31 of Jeremiah chapter 31. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, that is the New Testament, with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the days I took them by the hand to bring them out of Egypt. My covenant which what? They broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law where? Within them. And on their heart I will write it. And I will be my, their God. And they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor. And each man his brother saying, Know the Lord. For they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity. And their sins what? Praise God, I will remember no more. What a glorious Savior we have. God doesn't have a list of your sins. Because you know what? Jesus has already paid for all of your sins. But what God does have is a relationship and fellowship with you. And when you allow sin to build up in your life, your fellowship with God can be broken. And it's just like praying and it bounces off the ceiling. You know when you're not getting through. Because if you allow sin to live in your heart and life, then your fellowship with God will be enhanced greatly. Broken greatly, I should say. So, 
the New Testament, the new covenant that God gives to us. He says, but if the ministry of death, talking about the, the stone tablets in letters engraved on stones came with glory so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face fading as it was, how will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? So what is he saying here? He's saying, you know what? The Ten Commandments on stones had a glory and a purpose, but when Moses came down from the mountain from being in the presence of God, and that glory shone on his face because God had been there and written the Ten Commandments, what happened to that glory? The brightness of his countenance, it began to fade away. The longer he was out of the presence of God, the more that that diminished, that glory, that presence of God. Now I want to ask you a question. When you go about our community, do you have the glory of God shining in your face? Do people look at you and say, wow, there goes a Christian. There goes somebody that loves the Lord. Listen to them, watch them. Their life is different. Man, they got something I want. That's what we want to be. We want to let the glory of God live in us and live through us and draw people to us so we can tell them about the glory, tell them about the comfort, tell them about the reassurance that only God can give. You know, one day, brothers and sisters, we're all going to draw our last breath. And all that's going to matter is what did you do with Jesus? Let me ask you, is there going to be somebody in heaven because you dared to share Jesus with them? Is there going to be somebody in heaven that's going to rise up and say, oh yes, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so told me about Jesus. And by faith, I ask him to come in. And he has never left me. He has transformed my life. You know what? That's what's going to matter. You got people all around you. They're dying and going to hell. Nobody's reaching out. Nobody's trying to teach them about Jesus. Listen, we go out on Saturdays, most Saturdays. We go and visit. You know how many people have responded to our visitation in the two or three years we've been doing it? One. It is so amazing to go out and visit with people and leave them the track about the word of God and they simply don't respond. I want to tell you what's happening in America. We are post-Christian. Just like Brother Paul said, going after the preachers in Canada, our time is limited before they start going after Christians and church members in America. How do I know? Look at what they're doing with the COVID virus. You have to get it. It's not if you want to get it. If you want to keep your job, you're going to get it. Now listen, I got the vaccine because I have issues with my lungs and stuff, so I thought I'd get it. But I think it is wrong when they make you get it. And I certainly don't believe someone should lose their job because they choose not to get it. But brothers and sisters, we are living in an age where democracy is dwindling away. They are desperately trying to make us a socialist nation. By the will of God, we need to pray that day never happens Amen. in America. And the only way that's not going to happen is when we stand up and speak up. And we let it be known that Jesus Christ is the hope of America, the hope of each school, Amen. the hope of each person. Let's Amen. pray together. Father, we thank you for your word today. Lord, how good you are. Lord, we thank you that one day we heard you call our name and you gave us even the faith to believe it and to step out and to publicly come to you and declare you 
as our Lord and Savior. My Father, there may be church members or people in this room right now they don't really know whether or not they'd go to heaven should you call them today. Lord, if there's anyone in here like that, give them the faith to step out of that pew, to come to the front, and let me pray with them. Lord, they don't have to say anything, but just come to the front, and I will lead them to you, Lord. Father, this invitation is for your glory alone. Be glorified as you move amongst us. For it's in Jesus' wonderful name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Brother Paul. Invitation 309.